Welcome back to The Real News. I'm Jessel Noor. This is our second part of our conversation with Antero Piatella about his book, Ghost of Johns Hopkins, The Life and Legacy That Shaped an American City. Thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you. So in part one, we talked about some of the history of Hopkins and the relationship to the people of Baltimore. And this history is continuing to be written. Um, just last week, seven people were arrested, taking part in a month-long sit-in at Hopkins. But I want to start with, this, with the news of this new report by National Nurses United, which is aiming to unionize nurses at Hopkins Hospital. They released a scathing report that found that since 2009, Hopkins has filed more than 2,400 lawsuits seeking payment of medical debt. Uh, the report found Hopkins disproportionately sued residents of low-income black neighborhoods in Baltimore and argued that because Hopkins is a nonprofit that receives tens of millions annually in tax breaks, something like 164 million alone in tax exemptions in 2017, it should provide care to those who can't afford it. Uh, we contacted Johns Hopkins for a response, and this is what they sent us. They said, our mission is to improve the health of our community, and everything we do to, is to advance that goal. Our first priority is providing care. Those who have the ability to pay for their health services should do so. For those who cannot pay, we consider it our mission to make sure they receive the care they need. Um, so again, you know, Hopkins is back in the spotlight um, for its treatment of its black neighbors. This is uh, a continuing uh, uh, part of a continuing saga. Uh, Hopkins, when it was created, the hospital was created, it was the only hospital in a segregated city that treated blacks, as long as they were indigents. And, and so, so uh, in today's situation, we talk about a city where disparities are very pronounced, so that there is uh, talk about uh, a white L and a black butterfly on neighborhoods that are totally dis disparate. The, the uh, uh, prestige neighborhoods are in the white L. The, the poor neighborhoods and, and crime and, and uh, poverty, they are in the black butterfly. And so, so uh, what, what Hopkins uh, website says is that on an annual basis, they provide $32 million worth of services free to, to indigents. But again, uh, their, their criteria are very strict. And, and so it's also interesting that they, they talk about how, how um, the, uh, m many of the people uh, that they uh, go after in, in trying to collect this money, they may have the uh, resources to pay, but they choose not to pay. Mm. And so, so they are just, and, and, and what we have to remember is that the whole hospital scene, it has changed quite a bit from, from Johns Hopkins' days. In those days, hospitals were, uh, uh, they, they were uh, last resort uh, care facilities for people who knew that they were dying. Today, Hopkins is a citadel of hope where miracles happen on a daily basis. And so, so much of this then is, uh, 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 Hopkins has to, has to fund its operations. And, and this is one of the up, uh, reasons is that it goes, goes after, after people who, who do not pay. Yeah, and you know, the, report, the report notes that the subsidies it gets from taxpayers far outweigh uh, how much it uh, how much it it has to collect from yes. from its low income residents? Um, so, I also wanted to ask you about the recent protests um, at Johns Hopkins against the recently authorized private police force. Uh, seven people were arrested last week as Hopkins uh, called in Baltimore police to end a more than month long sit in. Uh, protesters had chained themselves to the to the build the, the campus administration building, Garland Hall. They said they wouldn't leave until Hopkins abandoned its recently authorized private police force and its contracts with immigration and customs enforcement. Um, and uh, you know the, the the protests got the backing of faculty groups, of student groups. I have constantly seen my peers, my fr my friends, myself being targeted by um, the already present law enforcement entities on this campus, and it's very terrifying for us to think that you know these minor inconveniences of being um, assumed to be no good people around this campus. Um, 
it's scary to think that that could be weaponized and be turned into a matter of life and death. This is what democracy looks like. Thing that's endangering Hopkins students isn't um, some mythical racialized beast of crime. What's hurting Hopkins students, what's making Hopkins students unsafe, is. Um, sexual assault of fraternities, is um, a counseling center that's woefully understaffed, is the Hopkins um, administration not standing with undocumented immigrants. And I was present at the Homewood Faculty Assembly where we voted unanimously to express our dismay at a private police force on the Hopkins campus. We are entirely opposed to this idea. We also expressed solidarity with the students organizing the sit-in and specifically uh, are asking that the university not penalize any students who are participating in the sit-in. Um, Hopkins said they had to move in because the conditions weren't safe uh, in, in Garland Hall. Um, what, are your, what were your thoughts, you know, just having completed this book just a few months ago, just, just being out, um, the ghost of Johns Hopkins, your thought on these continuing protests today, um, adre you know, they're talking about the same issues, policing, crime, um, fairness. Unionization. <laughs> and, and all this is history repeating itself. Uh, the the uh, occupation of the administrative building was a repeat of something that happened in 1969 when students occupied the building to protest uh, Hopkins' participation in ROTC, the Reserve Officers Training Corps. This was at the height of the Vietnam War. And Hopkins was a quite passive campus or had been up to that the time and and then this energized and this was seen as a as a mobilization tool and similarly similarly there is lots of controversy today about unionization now the, the unionization campaign has been going on at hopkins for lots of years and and hopkins has always been quite hostile toward unions uh, arguing that it is in a business where union meddling should not be tolerated. And in the beginning, when the old CIO was trying to uh, create a union at Hopkins, there was actually a law that uh, prohibited unions from being present at hospitals, charity hospitals like Hopkins. And so talk, so I want to ask you about the, um, the union campaign in 1970 at Hopkins Hospital. Uh, to, uh, it was one of the organizations that took part where there were community groups, but also um, one of the organizations that Dr. Martin Luther King helped found and participate right. in. This was at the time when, when unionization uh, was starting at various hospitals. And, and what, what uh, had happened was that a couple of months before the Johns Hopkins unionization campaign began, uh, Southern Christian Partnership, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference in partnership with, with uh, a New York-based uh, union had, had uh, successfully unionized a hospital in South Carolina. And so now they came to Baltimore uh, promising to, to uh, do the same at Hopkins, and that ultimately happened, but it was a very tortuous and long and, and very uh, controversial chapter in Hopkins's history. Now, so Hopkins, um, so one of the one of the things that the that the opponents of the Hopkins police force say is they so they they note that um, Hopkins officials gave sixteen thousand dollars on a single day to the to the campaign of former Mayor Catherine Pugh um, just one month before she introduced the bill for the Hopkins private police force and say this was this was they call it corruption even though I mean it was legal but they say it was corruption because they helped sort of influence her decision. Um, do, you, do you see any historical parallels with that, you know, with Hopkins? You know, it's said Hopkins always gets its way. It's always going to find a way to, to get what, it's want, what it wants. Well, Hopkins is the largest uh, private sector employer in the city, not only in the city, but also in the state of Maryland. So it, it does have lots of uh, clout. And, and so uh, should I be shocked that, that politics is tied to campaign contributions, whether legal or illegal? I'm not shocked at all. I mean, this is, this is how the business is done. And, and the only thing that is interesting is that we have these revelations and we at least know that this happened. And um, the whole issue of safety, uh, that's, that's what Hopkins says it's pursuing with this private police force. Um, and you've, 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 talk, you've touched upon how um, in your book, how um, the government created slums, the government created concentrated poverty. Um, if we, if we're going to remedy, if we're going to have 
you know, so so a lot of people say the Hopkins police, Hopkins police force, it's not going to solve, it's not going to solve poverty. Um, how how can we actually solve the root causes of how do we address it? Do you think well, policing will address it, or do you think there needs to be other? No, policing is not going to address it. Baltimore is uh, is a very bigoted city and has has a history of bigotry that uh, continues to uh, today. Uh, not only is the city very segregated, but it was one of the 239 American cities that was redlined, uh, affecting investment in various parts of the city. Today, we have subprime uh, mortgage loans and many other uh, expressions of uh, uh, discrimination. But one of the key uh, reasons for poverty in Baltimore, I am I'm absolutely confident, is the redlining that is going on in terms of public transportation. Uh, not only is the city uh, uh, short of uh, uh, low-level jobs, but it also has a, a population that largely is ill-prepared to hold a job. Many of the applicants, they have a criminal record. And then you have this awful system of tra mass transportation that, that makes it almost impossible to reach uh, potential employment sites. It's interesting that when Amazon located uh, fulfillment facilities, big warehouses and fulfillment facilities in Baltimore, one of the first things it did, it created a transportation system of its own to, just to get the uh, workers to its facilities. The same about Hopkins. Hopkins has a transportation company that shuttles people within the various locations that the university and the medical institutions have around the city. Critics say that Governor Larry Hogan redlined the red line because that would have been mass transit of a rail that would have connected east and west Baltimore to the counties. And uh, he, he, that was one of his first acts in office was to block that. And There is no po political penalty in doing that. Uh, we have a, a bare bones um, uh, metro system, one, one uh, line in Baltimore. We have a light rail system. And it is interesting that in the, in, in the light rail system, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the area, Roxton, opted out of the, uh, uh, having, having a stop in their community. And now there is an active campaign going on in Anne Arundel County, uh, a county uh, south of Baltimore, to get rid of existing uh, light rail stops because it's seen that they are bringing outsiders, quote, outsiders who don't belong to the neighborhood. And, and the fear is that this is increasing crime. Now, there is no, no real evidence that this is so, uh, but, but this is how, what voters believe. And those are similar arguments made over 100 years ago when Baltimore passed the first racial segregation yes, law in the yes. country. OK, well, thank you so much for joining us. Antero well, Piatella, you. author of Ghost of Johns Hopkins, uh, a lot of people are familiar with your book, Not in My Neighborhood. And, and as I try to emphasize, this is really a companion to that book. It talks not only about the history of Johns Hopkins, but the history of Baltimore and the history of policing and so much more. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank us. you. And thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.